morning. Welcome to the B4 Business Brunch. I'm Frank Negriello, and I'm joined by my colleague, customer service expert, Stephen Spencer. And we're here to talk about a favorite topic of ours that we talk about a lot, and that's customer service at Disney. Now, Stephen, you know, I always say that I've had many visits to Disney, and every time I go, it's like an MBA in customer experience. But you're actually a graduate of the Disney Institute. What was that like? Well, it was amazing, Frank, um, and, and it was even more amazing because I actually kind of worked my way back from already being invested in Disney principles and, and practices um, to then actually getting to study them at the Disney Institute in, in, uh, in Florida. And um, I, I kind of had my first Disney experience in 1992. I actually was fortunate enough to be invited to uh, the pre-opening of um, uh, Euro Disneyland in Paris, as it, it was then called. And I was just blown away by this complete environment of, of, um, of fantasy, of fun, of incredible service, of these spontaneous magical moments that you, you can't possibly imagine how, how they could be orchestrated. And then a few years later, um, I was working at the National Trust for Scotland and I, um, I heard from the visitor services director from MoMA in New York, in fact, um, how they had implemented Disney uh, service practices to improve the visitor experience at MoMA. And I always remember her saying, um, we scoured the world to find a program that wasn't Disney because we just didn't think it was appropriate for an art museum. And in the end, we went to Disney because they're the best. So I, I was, you know, my interest uh, was really piqued by this point. And when I finally got to go to the Disney Institute, it was an incredible week long, totally immersive experience of, of learning in the situation. So you would learn some key principles and then you would go and actually see how they did it in, in, in the real experience in the park, but not just the park, behind the scenes as well. You know, we went to the laundry, the biggest laundry in the world and found out how the employees in the laundry were just as engaged in creating wonderful experiences and magical memories for their guests as anyone on the front line. So, yeah, it was it was it was a brilliant experience and, and I've been a fan ever since. Well, I think you were very lucky to do that. I you was. know, um, in, in Unipart, we've had a very clear philosophy to meet the real and perceived needs of our customers better than anybody else. And that's really been part of the fabric of our company since it started. A lot of my thinking in the programs and changes that we've introduced in Unipod has been shaped by what I've seen at Disney. And that's affected everything from the way we communicate to the way we set up our restaurant and the way we think about what it's like to be in a space and how we share that space with our colleagues. I was just wondering, so in, in the roles you've had, how has that Disney experience influenced your work? Well, one of the things that um, I learned at the Disney Institute was that, uh, you know, how you achieve this in incredible um, experience. Um, and, and, you know, I think then they had 55,000 employees. Um, pre pandemic, it was more like 70,000. You know, sometimes organizations struggle to to get, you know, half a dozen people all on the same page and, and delivering the same to the same vision. So how did they do it? It was through a very, very simple model. And um, it started with the service theme. You know, what is it that we're trying to deliver um, and standards that, that support that? Um, then obviously a big focus on the team or the cast, as Disney call it, um, the people who will actually deliver the experience. The setting, which is the environment you were talking about, the restaurant at Unipart, you know, just what does that look like, feel like, sound like, smell like, and of course, in, in the case of a restaurant, taste like. Um, and then the process is to um, ensure that all of those things were maintained and, and um, developed um, day in, day out. And at the heart of it, and this was one of the things that I, I really took away from the Institute, was what they call guestology, you know, really understanding um, what the guest wants, needs, what their emotional state is, how we actually get them into the place that they've, they want to be, that, that they've come for. Um, and, and there were two points about that. One was, 
they told us people, this was a few years ago, but people on average saved for two and a half years to go to Walt Disney World. Mm. So they said, you know, think about that. Think about how important it is that we get it right when they're here. And second was we did an exercise on customer lifetime value. So actually working out, you know, if you if you attract and retain and make loyal a customer over however many years they might spend. I mean, crikey, you're probably the most valuable customer Disney has. How many times have you been to Disney World, Frank? It's over 25 times. I'm yeah. Afraid. So, you know, how much money you have spent with Disney yeah. and how much of a, an advocate for Disney you are this is such a fundamental business principle, isn't it? Every business should think about that. It's not just a one-time interaction with a customer. It's it's building, hopefully, a lifetime of engagement and, and just how you maximise that for both parties. Well, I think, you know, it all sounds terribly simple when we discuss it at this level, but actually doing it is really, really hard. Yeah. And, you know, I speak from bitter experience, um, as having having applied quite a lot of the things I learned. One of those was around training. And, you know, I, I, I used to run a training company. And for me, training is like the essential element that sets Disney apart because all their people are very, very, very well trained. Yeah. And I've seen that many times. And I've, I've probed that a bit. In fact, I think anybody watching this today should really be thinking about the level of training that they provide for their people and the level of training they do themselves. Do they continually study? Are they continually thinking and learning about how to do more for their customers? You know, it, it, it's made it clear to me on many occasions. You know, when I've been talking to cast members in Orlando, that training makes all the difference to them. And another important thing I've taken away from that is their ability to predict customers' needs. You refer to it by their term, guestology, which is, uh, it hides a lot because there's a lot in that. It's not about having a crystal ball, but there is a science of using data and recording the sorts of customer complaints and inquiries over time. Like maybe that's gonna be like over a month or something, or maybe two, and then creating categories for those topics to see what's on your customers' minds. But that's, that's not enough. A lot of people do that. So, you know, what, what have our customer complaints been? What do we do about that? What Disney people are really good at is analyzing the data and then proactively providing information or responses to their customers, things that customers can use proactively. So to give you an example, I've been at the Magic Kingdom on a number of occasions when I've had cast members come up to me and give me advice proactively about things that could make a difference to my day. They might just say, hey, you know, have you seen the parade? Uh, you know, are you ready? Are, have you got a spot for the parade? Could we suggest somewhere for you to go? They're really good at working out what their guests need and providing it proactively. So I think if you think about that and you're an accountant, for instance, uh, in Oxford, you're one of our many accountants, um, have you been telling your colleagues, your customers, how to get a tax advantage from working from home? Or are you waiting for them to watch Martin Lewis to figure it out? Yeah. You know, if you're an IT supplier, have you been talking to your customers about the best kit for working from home? You know, I, I, have you applied that, what you know, your knowledge and understanding what your customers want to being proactive with your customers to bring them back time and time again? You know, they, they say that's the Disney way. But I just think that's really, really good business. Yeah, I, there's a sort of simple tool that I took away, which I think any business could could use. Um, and, and I think people at the front line as well, you know, whether it's the telephone receptionist of, of the, the legal firm or whether it's people in shops and hospitality businesses. And, and it's like a compass. And the, the four points of the compass are needs, wants, emotions and stereotypes. So, you know, by simply thinking, and, and it is putting yourself in your customer's shoes, you know, what do they need? What do they want? And they may be two different things. Um, needs, you know, in terms of, um, uh, you know, improve my financial position. Uh, wants in terms of 
finding a way to do that that is that is simple and painless. So, you know, advice about the tax break, emotions, uh, you know, very often people arrive at your business, I'm sure not your business, Frank, but particularly a lot of the businesses I work with, hospitality and, and retail businesses, um, you know, pissed off because they've had a bad journey or the parking was a problem or the kids have been screaming. And so we need to know that at this point of arrival, their emotional state is perhaps agitated, perhaps confused because they don't know what to do, where to go. Um, what do they need? They probably need a toilet, baby change, coffee. Um, what they don't need is to be run through a whole list of today's specials or, or you know, the, the, the promotion that we're running today. So it's getting them very quickly to have what they want, to manage their emotional state, to, to be what they would want, not necessarily even what you would want. And then the other way that is really helpful to apply that is, is the stereotypes. And by that, I always say it's, it's, um, it's uh, their stereotype of us, not our stereotype of them. So for example, what are they expecting based on what they've heard about us? You know, they might have heard that we're difficult to deal with, or we're expensive, or we're stuffy, um, or you know that that um, con on the other side of the coin that we're the most brilliant business to deal with. So we've got to understand that they have certain expectations coming in that we need to at least meet, if not exceed. And they may, may be positive or negative or a combination. So listening and looking and using you know, your, your senses to understand body language um, and listen to the words that people are saying and really understand what that actually means is incredibly important. And it's a, I, I think it's a tool that everyone can practice. And actually, if everyone did practice, you know, if we all listen to each other more, we'd actually make a better world, regardless of, of uh, you know, business. Um, because, you know, wouldn't you want to go into a business and be met by somebody smiling and friendly and interested in you? And that doesn't come about through chance. It comes about because that business has recruited people who share its values. Um, but also, as you said, Frank, that they train them and they support them and they develop them so that they can feel fulfilled and feel they're doing their best work and feel that um, they have an opportunity to make a difference. Just going back to that laundry example, um, we heard how they made it possible for employees in the laundry to um, tell them things that they could be doing better. And you know those kind of trucks on wheels that uh, hotels put all their dirty linen into? And it all goes back to the laundry. And because they're very deep, these trucks, they were hooking the last few sheets out with, uh, with a metal hook. And every now and again, they'd tear a hole in a sheet, so they'd have to throw it away. And one of the employees said, why don't we just wrap some brown tape around those hooks? And then they wouldn't tear the sheets. And they saved $100,000 a year by doing that. And they said, you know, if 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 people weren't motivated to share these ideas because they they didn't care or they felt we weren't prepared to listen, we wouldn't have saved a hundred thousand dollars a year. And there's examples time and time and time again of how employees make a difference, even in such a big organization. Uh, Stephen, I, I'm a, a huge fan of employee input, and certainly. In, in my career in Unipod over 20 years, I've seen hundreds of stories of our own employees taking the, the program we have, which is called Our Contribution Counts, and using it to solve problems in the workplace that make an enormous difference to the way we deliver value to our customers and also to just, you know, the efficiency of, of our business and to their own jobs. So I'm a huge fan of that. I think that's so important. I've getting your employees to help you to make your business better all the time. But, you know, we, we, we can't really talk about Disney uh, at, 
for a period without mentioning the magic. And I don't know how how you think about this, but my my, my daughters who've been going to Disney since they were sort of three and five, um, and now they're both grown women, both doctors, they still talk about the Disney magic. And I've asked them at times, how do you how do you define it? What what do you think the magic is? And my youngest daughter says has a great definition for it. And she said to me, you know, Dad, it's the sense of surprise that you get when things happen that you didn't expect, but they're really fantastic. And it could be something very, very, very simple, or, but some, or something very complex. And I recall at one stage, walking down Main Street early in the morning and a guy coming up to us and saying, have you ever been grand marshals in the parade? And we were like, no, what, how, how would you do that? He said, well, would you like to be? If you turn up here at one o'clock, you could be grand marshals today. And, you know, we just did. And there was just a spontaneity about some of the things that have happened there where cast members can kind of understand people who've been there a lot, people who, who would really get great benefit from doing something and offer them something that could be either very, very small, very simple, or actually something that makes your whole trip. And I think that's so exciting. Can you, can you, how do you think about the magic? What's it meant to you? Well, I think um, it, it is that uh, sense of, of immersion, isn't it? Of actually being in the experience. So you're not just a passive um, bystander. Um, and, you know, you, you feel, uh, it, it's interesting. I've got a friend called Joe Pine who actually um, is regarded as the godfather of um, the experience economy. And he actually wrote the book um, the experience economy and um, he talks about there being four realms of, of an experience um, entertainment which obviously Disney delivers in spades um, educational which again D Disney doesn't always do overtly but definitely provides education on, on a whole range of levels um, escapist, which again, um, you know, people have the opportunity, whether it's going on the rides or just, you know, being in environments that, that as sort of like a, a fantasy of where they would, where they would most like to be back in the days of, you know, the pirates of the Caribbean or, um, you know, in, in Arabian nights or wherever and aesthetic and aesthetic is the one that, um, is sort of, it's about creating that that setting, that environment that is complete in every detail. So literally there is no chink in the armor. You know, you never see uh, Mickey with his head yeah. off. Um, you know, you never see cast members off duty. Um, and he talks about within that, the, the, um, the, the passive versus active participation. And I think what you described there was active participation um, which not everybody wants. A lot of yeah. people are quite happy to be, you know, passive uh, observers um, uh, of the experience. But making, especially for children, of course, and families, making it possible for them to actually be in the parade, be in the experience um, is, is incredibly powerful. Interesting point. Um, I worked for Hamley's uh, toy shop. Uh, earlier in my career and um, Hamleys went on an expansion program which failed miserably and the reason it failed was because they hadn't realized inevitably we, we were taken over new management came in thought they knew what was the Hamley Hamleys uh, magic they hadn't realized it's very very expensive to deliver magic uh, as well as complicated as he said and so when Hamley stores were opening in places like Romford and Sheffield and Luton, it wasn't viable to deliver this magic. And this brings me to a really, really crucial point. And I, I mentioned the customer lifetime value, which is if you get this right, if you plan the experience, you motivate the team and you really focus on the guest and you have processes to underpin that, um, you can ma maximize the uh, and monetize the experience. 
And that means that it is viable to do it better and better and better. Um, there's nothing worse, you know, than than experiences that are created and then they the business has to cut corners because it shows really quickly, doesn't it? And the only way to do it to the level that Disney do it, and you know, people are cynical about it, exit through the gift shop and all the rest of it, but the more money you spend actually probably the more fun you're having maybe not when you get home and get the credit card bill but you know that's how it works and that's why it's been a sustained success for so many decades i think that's really really true and and you know the thing one of the things i've i've noticed and and certainly try to utilize is this idea of planned spontaneity which sounds like it's a contradiction but actually it's not um, and it's the idea that people can perceive something to be spontaneous, but if you've made the investment and you've put the things in place that you know will deliver to you the best possible result, that you can do things in a slightly different way when people come to see you. My, my best example of that is at times having business meetings with some of our clients or people we wanna to talk to in our company restaurant and simply inviting over one of the staff to explain how they use our digital communication cell every day. Yeah. And you know the the people that I talk to say that's really amazing that you know here you have someone who is working in a restaurant it's clearly not part of your core business but who's using the same tools that you use in your warehouses and in your offices and can speak about it with such fluency and such commitment and of course it seems terribly spontaneous to do that but the reason we can do that is that we've taken the time to train our people and actually have our people use those tools really really effectively to the benefit of their own part of the business and i think that's something i've seen in disney in many many places you know taking a a boat ride from one place to another and having the skipper on the boat do stand up you know, for the 10 minutes you're on the boat. Well, that's not something he thought of in the moment. He's prepared that, and I'm sure he does that on every trip and he maybe changes it slightly, but it's something that just is spontaneous and interesting for the passengers and for the, the people who will remember that everywhere they go. And will that will be just another nice point of their day while they're wasting time sitting on a boat traveling from one place to another. Yeah, I, I do think also that, uh, you, you know, because Disney's so big and because um, it does it so well, and despite it being a simple model, as we've said, it, it is complex. Um, how do, you know, regular businesses um, apply some of what you've been talking about? And I think, you know, the more you can actually do um, uh, the planning of your experience as a team exercise, you know, involve a cross section or everybody, depending on the size of the organization and say, OK, if this is our service theme, if this is what we aim to deliver, if this is, you know, why we're in business um, to deliver these products, these services to these customers, um, you know, how could we make that uh, a better uh, product, better service than anyone else in our field? And uh, I think one of the ways you you would do that is to say well let's think about those customers let's think about what they need from us you know this is a time when what we thought was normal what we assumed would work has all been thrown up in the air hasn't it by the obvious circumstances yeah. and that means there's a huge opportunity to say all right guys whatever we were doing before you know let's draw a line under that let's do some sort of exciting relaunch, rejuvenate ourselves around this very simple model of the service theme, the setting, the environment in which the experience takes place. Um, what are the team going to do? And how do we really get ourselves into the, the minds and the shoes and the eyes of our customers so we can deliver that to the max? And, and any business can do that. Wouldn't you agree, Frank? I think absolutely. I think it's one of the best investments that any business can make. And, you know, right now, 
I'll start from the phone ringing. There's, <laughs> there's an ideal Pl planned spontaneity, Frank. Planned spontaneity. <laughs> it always happens. But uh, uh, you know, apart from just thinking about safety and climbing back, building back from COVID, there is, you're absolutely right. It's a great time for companies to look at what they do and say, well, are there one or two things that we can do much better? Yeah. Are there one or two things we can invest in? Yeah, Stephen, the time has just flown by. I know. Uh, I've so enjoyed talking to you as, as I always do um, about Likewise. the experiences we've both had. You know, even after 25 years of going to Florida, I'm itching to get back to Disney World. And I really hope we're going to be able to do that. Thanks so much for spending this time with me and with our colleagues at B4. It's been my pleasure. And, and I hope everyone's got something out of it. And see you in Florida. I hope so. Bye.